It's obvious that raw fear is a, a powerful emotion, and there's no doubt that you can get results coaching that way. What would be the counterbalance on the high positive side? Well, let me just, one thing uh, in the same venue, when, when you have a young boy or girl who is so driven and it's coming from within them, just sit back and realize that you are in a very, very, very powerful position, even much more so than where you're trying to rally some force inside them to take them somewhere because they will do literally anything you say. They will also accept abuse in any way that you deliver it because they so desperately want the success. So when you have someone who's deeply, deeply driven for whatever needs, we don't know what, but some kids come to us and they are, I mean, they are driven and there's almost nothing that they wouldn't do to fulfill this drive inside them. And those are the most at risk because they will, they're willing to do anything, sacrifice everything, do whatever is necessary and whatever you say, since in a sense, you hold the keys to the kingdom. So there's no question that if you use punishment, fear, and threat, you can get people to do amazing things. I mean, amazing things. If you get people into survival mode, you know, they're going to fight like dogs, and you'll be able to see things. And particularly if you use anger, anger subdues choking, subdues fear. The chemistry of anger and the chemistry of fear can't coexist. So some coaches realize that you actually can make people angry, and they'll actually play better. And you can dehumanize them, you can accuse them or call them names that infuriate them, and, this, and all the nerves suddenly go away. That's what the screamer, the screamer coaches actually begin to realize, that they can get a lot of the chemical changes in their players by the way they treat them, interact with them, and it becomes a, a matter of manipulation, as opposed to allowing them to figure this out and helping them understand how to control nerves. So there is a way to bring in what you might call harsh coaching and get people to do extraordinary things. Is there another alternative? And it really is, we know that human beings tend to perform much better when they are driven from what we call opportunistic emotions. When they see the opportunity to do something extraordinary, and even extraordinary, not for myself, but for a cause much bigger than myself. It's called relatedness. That human beings respond when it, in a very special way when they realize all this hard work and suffering really isn't about them in the first place. It's how they can contribute to something or someone, and that's why so many of the coaches who were up here today realize that when they're fighting for a loved one, for this young uh, girl who was struggling with cancer, when uh, they're doing it for uh, you know, a cause that really is more than just about their own validation, their own self-interest. We can get, I think, more sustainable results. We can get much more positive outcomes without all the, the potential downside. But that means you have to still be tough. This is not you know, trying to be simply this you know, opportunistic uh, voice of positivism. And you never hold people accountable. You never push people. You never drive people. You never, there is a balance. And the great coaches have actually figured it out. John Wooden was very tough. He was a taskmaster. And, but he had their best interest always at stake. It was never about John, it was about them. And how what he did with them and to them would affect them for the rest of their lives. And that's the perspective he had. He had the 20 year perspective. And that's what we're hoping coaches who've been part of this kind of you know, a real in-depth look at what your role is in the coaching profession, a very noble profession. This is the perspective you have. How will what I'm doing to them today play out in the context of their life in 20 years? That's how you have to think. Jack, as, as Jim is saying those things, what are the thoughts that are going through your mind? 
Well, it's, it's where our real report card of, of coaches comes. Um, a lot of times it's, it's after the seasons that we're in, and that doesn't mean that you know, we don't want to win. It's just that, you know, I mean, I guess we have you know, 24 national championships, and if, you know, if this really becomes about shiny goblets and a showcase, you know, I don't know, you know, I mean, it's not that, it's not that motivating. Um, as much as you want to be at the top of the podium, at the end of the year, I think the payday, the report card, the, the real sense of satisfaction, you know, comes later on. You know, it comes when, you know, your athletes are, 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 are successful. They go on to either, even further academic scholarship. Uh, they go on to great professional success in a variety of sectors. Um, you know, have a reunion sometime. You know, have, have a reunion 20 years, 30 years later, you know. If they all show up, that means it was a really, really rewarding experience, and it's one that is helping to shape their lives today, and, and they're grateful for that experience. And at that point, you know, you, you couldn't feel any better as a coach. On the other hand, you know, there, there's a converse to that, and sometimes you win, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very toxic environment. It's an environment that, uh, um, that is maybe talent-based, maybe fear-based, as we're saying. Uh, and although there's some success, uh, competitive success, you know, the lessons are, aren't really very valuable. They, they, don't, they don't transfer to the rest of your life. And if they do transfer, they're very harmful. And, and Billy, one of the conversations we had was, I asked you, because I, I, I don't want this to be idolistic. And so I asked you, you know, can you develop character at the highest level of college athletics? And one of your responses was, sometimes the job gets in the way. And what do you mean by that? <laughs> That's a great comment. <laughs> That's a great comment. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think we, we had talked about this. I did this with our team one time, and I think earlier today we had the, um, the, the moral character and the performance character. And I posed a question one year to one of our teams that if you could end up playing in the NBA for 15 years, be an NBA All-Star, a Hall of Fame player, and go down as one of the greatest players to ever play the game in your position, would you take that and bypass all the moral character and not have any of those traits and qualities? And I would say there was only three kids that said that they would, uh, that they would choose the moral character over the performance character. Hmm. And that was very, very alarming to me because the thing I was trying to get them to understand was that they could not really succeed and have success unless they had moral character. That that actually was the most important thing. But I think because of society deeming what success is, they don't even think about those things, about being trustworthy, being loyal, being kind, compassionate, considerate, empathetic, all those moral characters that shape who we are as people. They don't see the correlation between the competitive part of being resilient and competitive and hardworking and all those things. They don't see the crossover. And I, to your point, Brett, had spent a lot of time trying to get them to see those things. And it was really amazing. The guys on our team that were doing very, very well on the court had a lot of the competitive characters. The guys whose lives were not doing well off the court lacked and a lot of moral character. And I felt like it was my job to try to tie in both of those things to let them see how they both play off each other in terms of their success on and off the court. I just would love to add that we can't prove that we value it if we don't measure it and reward it every day and every week. And so as a coach, and you think about how can I embed tomorrow at practice, start recognizing the person that hustled the most, the most unselfish, reward these people, Give time off at practice because you hustled for the last two hours. If we measure it and we reward it, it becomes a value to them and it, they sustain it. Yeah, and to that point, so one, a great coaching line was, uh, you can tell what a coach values by what they're willing to lose for. What do you guys think about that? You know, uh, you're always at risk because you're always afraid what might happen if you don't get the right W in the box. 
But you really, you really are tested every day. How much do I really value winning, and how much do I really develop value development for the human being? And um, I think it's the perspective again that you have: Are we playing for today, or are we playing for a much longer perspective that ultimately is the measure of success in a human being? I think that's well stated. Thank you guys for coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.